series in a number of speeches uh, co-sponsored again by the FCCT and the International Peace Foundation. Jose Ramos Horta is perhaps best known and one of the most articulate and passionate voices in East Timor's long struggle for independence. Traveling abroad in 1975, when the for former Portuguese colony was invaded and annexed by Indonesia, he remained in exile, serving as a tireless ambassador to the United Nations for the East Timorese cause. For his efforts, he was awarded the 1996 Nobel Peace Prize, uh, shared with his compatriot Bishop Carlos Bello. Presently, he is the senior minister and Minister of Foreign Affairs and Cooperation for the now independent country of East Timor, Liest. He has continued to pursue uh, his peace initiatives throughout the world, having been involved in hostile negotiations in Colombia and serving as a mediator between warring parties in uh, New Guinea-Bissau. He is a distinguished visiting professor at a number of universities, namely University of Victoria, uh, University of New South Wales, and the holder of more than 10 honorary PhDs uh, from some of the most prestigious universities in the world. He's also a patron of the International Peace Foundation. So without further introduction, please join me, welcome him, His Excellency Jose Ramos Horta. times in this club you all have been so kind so hospitable I decided to bring a small souvenir from uh, East Timor and actually from the foundation of Mrs. Kirsty Sword Guzman whenever I travel and need some souvenirs I ask her foundation to prepare them made by handmade by Timorese women and I want to leave this as a souvenir for uh, this great uh, press club Uh, first, I want to thank you again for uh, once, uh, once again uh, inviting me to come to uh, meet with you, uh, not really to address the club, but actually to meet with you. And uh, I had uh, offer the topic, the unipolar world, can the U.S. lead to the International Peace Foundation? And only when it was published, publicized, then I regretted uh, having... Uh, uh, offer this theme that is a bit difficult to handle, <laughs> uh, but it is the subject of uh, the chapter of a book that I wrote recently, was published in Singapore. I don't have uh, access to the book yet, it is already out, but uh, so I will talk off the top of my head about uh, this uh, theme. And the theme uh, came about to, uh, in the period leading up to and after the Iraq crisis with the seeming uh, crisis disarray in the UN uh, system. And with the US appearing, you know, uh, as the culprit of the failings or disarray in the international collective uh, security system. And I try to offer maybe some more balanced uh, view but some of you might ask, you know, uh, and why my interest on this uh, topic anyway? Well, uh, I, from a long, long time, you know, as a teenager, I took interest in the United States. If today you travel to uh, East Timor and uh, go near my house, you will see uh, the street in front of my house is called Robert F. Kennedy Boulevard. Well, there was no name in the street, so I decided to baptize it Robert F. Kennedy Boulevard. And uh, so it is known now as uh, Robert F. Kennedy Boulevard. And uh, well, because of my early, you know, way back to the 60s, my uh, interest in the United States, and uh, then I lived uh, by accident of history, uh, 15 years in the 70s to the 80s, until one day uh, I really got completely burned out, you know, to survive, you know, uh, one year in the United States, in New York is already a major feat, to survive 15 years is an even greater feat, 
But by then I had, uh, was burned out, had had enough, and decided to leave for Australia. The Australians were gracious enough in granting me a uh, resident visa, so I went to Australia. But uh, before that, I had uh, the idea one day in the United States, be I thought one day if when I decide to leave this country, I want to take one year off to travel around the U.S., following the footsteps of Alex Tocqueville and write a book. But when I decided to leave, you know, well, I had had enough, broke, and didn't want one more week of New York, so I left. And uh, in 2001, after, uh, yeah, before September 11, many months before, uh, I had set to write a book about the U.S. called The Americans and the Rest of Us. But I interrupted it after uh, I was profoundly, personally shaken by September 11. And uh, I stopped writing for many months. And uh, only now, with uh, tremendous uh, pressure from uh, my literary agent in New York, William Morris, and uh, the publisher, I'm trying to really deliver the manuscript, which is not an academic book. It is simply a reflection of my experience and views about that extraordinary uh, country. Extraordinary in many aspects, positive and uh, negative. And that's why I, uh, I uh, wanted to, uh, in the aftermath, lead weeks leading to the Iraq crisis and after I decide to uh, talk on this uh, issue. And that is the unipolar world and can the U.S. lead? On one issue, it is, it's obvious, it is there. There is no debate, I presume, that the U.S. is, for better or for worse, the unchallenged superpower, the only surviving superpower today. Throughout history, power was seen through economic or military might. Those who have economic or military might, economic might backed by military might, were the ones that rule regions of the world. And that's how it has been. Up to uh, the end of the Cold War, many of us, particularly in the developing world, played the Soviet card. I remember soon after the end of the Cold War, conversing with a Somali, young Somali diplomat in Geneva. He told me of a group of African ministers who had gone to Washington, to London, and everywhere they were lecture in London and Washington about market economy, human rights, and democracy. And then he told me, if they had lectured us like that before, we'd have gone, after the visit to London, most, uh, Washington would have gone to Moscow. Well, now we went, they lecture, and we went back home worrying about, you know, their uh, new uh, environment. The f many in the third world was, were able to play the East-West card. The end of the Soviet Empire, the end of the Soviet bloc, left many in the developing world confused, unattended, without their traditional allies. And the U.S. became the sole surviving uh, superpower that dominate many issues on the debate in the UN, uh, on the UN agenda dominate many regions of the world. So that is a matter of fact. It is there, it's no debate. The question is, but with this awesome power that is recognized, that is envy of many, but also that cause resentment, fear, suspicion, with this awesome power, does the US have a division? Can it provide the leadership in today's world to address some of the problems that are uh, such as poverty, HIV, uh, malaria, extremism, all of that. Well, that remains to be seen. Does the U.S., is the U.S. capable with vision, with compassion, make use of its awesome power to transform the UN, to transform the international system, to really confront some of the issues that face humanity. Well, it remains to be seen. 
I uh, wrote an article, most of you probably, uh, some of you at least, I wouldn't to be so pretentious to think that most of you have read it, but uh, I wrote an article in the weeks leading to the Iraq crisis, I wrote an article which was published in the New York Times and uh, about the Iraqi question, but also particularly about the dilemma of the use of force or non-use of force or about the dilemma, the eternal dilemma of uh, <coughs> war and peace. The International Herald Tribune, with uh, due respect, the next day they reprinted the article in the New York Times and uh, almost automatically distorted what I had uh, written. And uh, I wrote to them and they graciously published the missing paragraph that made a difference in the article. But then I gave up trying to clarify my views because it was published around the world and each editor decided to uh, edit as they saw fit. But let me say what I uh, you know, wrote in that piece in the New York Times. In summary, this is what I said. A, the US as the unchallenged superpower should show more patience and give more time to the weapons inspectors. Not that the issue of the weapons of mass destruction was such a major issue for me. I even found the whole debate on the weapons of mass destruction as a bit like missing the point. I move on to the second point of my article and that is the U.S. should give time to the Secretary General who is not a friend of dictators, to mobilize a group of war leaders who would persuade Saddam Hussein to resign. Yes, the problem in the Iraq case is Saddam Hussein. To ignore the reality, the fact that that, that despot was in power for far too long, the very first man after World War II to use chemical and biological weapons on his own people, on Iranians and Kurdish. To launch the first environmental war ever in human history by blowing 700 oil fields in Kuwait. Invading Iran, invading Kuwait. Other leaders were ousted for much less. Joseph Estrada of Philippines is in jail for being a bit too greedy. Galtieri of Argentina, ousted within months for losing his little war with UK over Malvinas. Saddam Hussein unleashed a war that caused more than a million deaths on the Iran-Iraq war, he used chemical biological weapons, lost the war, then decided to turn to another country, smaller, less powerful than Iran, hoping that the rest of the world would do the same, would turn a blind eye lost again and remain ever defined in power. And this is at the end of 20th century, 21st century, when the Secretary General of the UN says there is no more binding international obligation than the Convention on Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide. When we have an international treaty that is so binding on the issue of genocide, and then, and we know that that, that man is one of the worst criminals ever in history. I would not go to the extent of comparing him to Hitler because it's much smaller scale. And then we do not have the obligation to cause the demise of that regime. Should we tell the Iraqis, the Kurdish, Saddam Hussein victims, sorry, if you don't mind, wait a bit longer in Saddam Hussein torture chambers, hang on in there because the Security Council has not authorized yet an intervention, so we cannot intervene. So we cannot help you because of the sacrosanct principle of non-interference, non-use of force. Well, I put you, I know, as I have done many times in different audiences, the issue, you know, uh, that is very near this region many of you probably cover and followed the genocide in Cambodia under the Khmer Rouge. 
Most of the world turned a blind eye to it. Only one man I remember spoke out, a prominent U.S. legislator, George McGovern. He called for an international in armed intervention to bring down the Khmer Rouge regime. He was not echoed by anyone else. Well, finally, whatever the motives of Vietnam, I, as a person, as a human being, I don't care about the motives of Vietnam. But Vietnam did intervene and ended the Khmer Rouge regime. Vietnam acted unilaterally outside the Security Council. So that intervention being unilateral without the authorization of the Security Council, a Security Council did not act and would not have acted for reasons you know, if not two or three, if not five permanent members, two or three would have vetoed any attempt to have the case of Meru genocide discussed, let alone authorize an intervention. Well, Vietnam intervened and ended genocide in Cambodia. No one else should be credit for that, only Vietnam. Did they have other motives? I'm sure they did have, but I don't care. Some of the victims of the Khmer Rouge who survived after Vietnam intervention, I saw them in Phnom Penh uh, June last year, met with them. They were, they were eternally grateful to the Vietnamese for saving them. So was the Vietnamese unilateral intervention in Cambodia inappropriate because it was not authorized by the Security Council? Was Julius Nyerere ordering his troops to intervene in Uganda around the same time as the Cambodian crisis and bringing down Idi Amin in the face of indifference in action by the Organization of African Unity and of the UN? So, Tanzanian unilateral intervention in Uganda to bring down Idi Amin was that also inappropriate because it had not been authorized either by the OEU or by the Security Council? Please, you know, let me, I don't read from these that I, may, I endorse unilateral interventions. My, the point in my article in New York Times, I concluded with one point, and that's what led people to believe that I endorse U.S. unilateral action in uh, Iraq. I said, I ended the article like this. I quoted a friend, a Kosovar journalist, intellectual, close collaborator of Rugova. He heard me speaking on Afghanistan in Prague in a forum organized by Václav Havel, where I talked precisely along the lines of the dilemma of war and peace and when to intervene and when not to intervene. I mentioned Afghanistan, I talked about Iraq long before the Iraqi crisis, and he came to me and said, my brother, I'm a, I have been a pacifist all my life. I work with Rugova. But when the NATO bombs began to fall in Serbia, I felt relieved, liberated, and I was grateful. Well, that's how the Kosovars felt. That was a unilateral, NATO intervention outside a Security Council mandate. Bill Clinton probably was smarter, slightly smarter than George W. Bush, because he knew if he attempted a resolution in the Security Council, it would have been vetoed by Russia, if not by one more country. So he turned, went around the Security Council and got NATO to intervene. And saving for the first time in NATO history, they should be proud, should be carried off saving a Muslim minority community in the heart of Europe. Was that not to be praised? When uh, weeks and months before, some Muslim leaders, I heard their speeches in Geneva at the Commission on Human Rights, blasting the West for hypocrisy, for doing nothing on Kosovo, because what at stake in Kosovo were few Muslims. Well, finally, led by Bill Clinton and Tony Blair, NATO intervened. Was it wrong also? Because it was the act outside the Security Council. So that is uh, the gist of my article in the New York Times. It was interpreted as uh, supporting U.S. intervention in uh, Iraq.
I'm not Mahatma Gandhi or Martin Luther King. Mahatma Gandhi, one of the greatest mistakes of the Nobel Committee was that they never gave him the Nobel Peace Prize. Actually, in talk with the friends in Oslo, they said that year, actually, they were going to give him the Nobel Peace Prize, but he was shot dead, and uh, he died, and uh, the Nobel Committee test, 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 uh, Testament does not give a posthumous uh, uh, prize. But it was one of the, if anyone in this uh, planet deserved the Nobel Peace Prize, was Mahatma Gandhi. I'm not Mahatma Gandhi, or Martin Luther King, or the Dalai Lama. They oppose any war under whatever excuses. No intellectual moral justification for a war. Well, I see it a bit differently. When you are in the receiving end of abuse, of oppression, of occupation, I don't know whether you have a time to intellectualize about the morality of war or peace. You want to be free. And this is what my friend from Kosovo said. The UN failed in Rwanda. As you know, Kofi Annan in his speech yesterday in Oslo on the conference on genocide, he acknowledged the lack of political will that allowed the genocide in, Kos in uh, Rwanda to take place with UN troops on the ground who instead of acting or being reinforced and acting, they actually withdraw. My question is, it might be po politically very correct. I should be, myself, Jose Ramos Orta, a bit smarter, intelligent, and uh, join the bandwagon of the politically correct people who oppose any war at whatever cost. And uh, I found myself sometimes in the embarrassed situation where I receive, you know, some emails from a movie star, a friend in El Hollywood, wondering, Jose, what are you doing? Supporting, you know, they said this extreme Bush administration a wonderful liberal American senator from Iowa, you know, uh, forwarding me a message saying, Jose, what are you doing? It would have been much easier, politically correct, simply to say no to U.S. intervention in Iraq, no to war, to any war. Well, but go and ask the Kurdish. The U.N. failed miserably in Iraq over the years. The UN failed miserably in Rwanda, as Kofi Annan himself acknowledged. But when we talk about these failures of the UN, what are we talking about? Well, we are talking about precisely the weaknesses, the failure of multilateralism. So when the US found argument the Bush administration found argument to intervene unilaterally in Iraq. Is this a reflection of George W. Bush tendency for unilateralism or rather or at the same time it's a reflection of the failure of multilateralism as we know it? Why 12 years after the Gulf War, after the sanctions, the man complete disarmament of Saddam Hussein, George W. Bush found reasons to intervene. Well, simple, politically correct, to criticize George W. Bush and Americans. But maybe it would be also necessary for the rest of the world to reflect on the conditions that led, that enabled, that gave ground, justification, pretext for uh, President George W. Bush to initiate this war in Iraq. Head of, he had, Saddam Hussein is gone. One of the greatest despots of this century is gone. It's cause for celebration. 
or should we indulge gloating over American increase in American casualties in Iraq? Can we be that cynical? Well, yesterday I stayed up till very late, till about two in the morning, trying to rush the preface of a book for uh, a book that to honor Serge Vieira de Mello to be published in March uh, <coughs> in, uh, in Paris. And I ended the preface like this. In this tragic story of Iraq, there are no heroes only villains. I said that in the context of saying earlier in the art in the preface that well the fact is that Saddam Hussein was Saddam Hussein there for 25 years. When he launched the war on Iran causing using chemical biological weapons the very West that today denounced him turn a blind eye and the inconsistencies hypocrisy double standards selectivity the list goes on and on that really put the question raise the question is the US can the US really lead the world in view of all of this I would have to say it does not seem to possess the qualities of leadership to make use of his awesome power to lead the world. But no, 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 not, neither are many other countries that they don't possess the economic or military might to do it or even the vision. I, I end with this. The U.S. He's spending, I don't know, hundreds of millions of dollars every month on the war in Iraq. Some estimates say 100 billion. 100 billion a year on Iraq, on the war and uh, occupation and reconstruction. <coughs> well, the entire industrialized world provides, assigned only 50 billion dollars a year to in, for overseas development assistance. 50 billion as against 100 billion in Iraq. 50 billion for the rest of the world. At the same time, the European Union countries and the United States allocate 300 billion dollars a year to subsidize their uneconomically unsound, uneconomical uh, agriculture sector. 300 billion dollars to keep the producers of Europe and United States cheap and dumping them in the third world markets. Thus, making it extremely difficult, if not entirely impossible, for hundreds of millions in the developing world that live off the land on agriculture to get off poverty. And so, a leadership would have to be one that has the courage to confront these problems of eliminating the trade barriers, eliminating the agricultural subsidies, really pro opening up European, US, Japanese markets to the poor in the world. Development assistance alone is not enough, and that's not what the poor countries want. They want equal opportunity, access to the, develop to the markets in the rich countries. Is this going to change? Well, I doubt that we are going to see uh, any uh, fundamental change in U.S. or European Union uh, policies in the years to come. I end here and will be very happy to answer questions from you. Thank you. Thank you, sir, very much. <laughs> We're moving into the question and answer period. Uh, before you ask a question, please state your name and the organization that you represent and make your question short, please. Uh, you can stand behind the microphone, sir. Let me uh, take the first question, uh, if you don't mind. Uh, let me turn the question uh, back to you, uh, Your Excellency, and ask you this. Do you think that the Iraqi people are eternally uh, grateful to the United States for uh, uh, liberating them from Saddam Hussein? 
Uh, I'm asking this because it's been many, many years that uh, Iraq had been under U.S.-led sanctions. They've been bombed and invaded by the United States uh, two times. And uh, uh, considering your past, I would like to ask this. Uh, if you were in Iraqi today, would you consider picking up arms to throw out the Americans as invaders, or would you work with the American administration uh, for the country's future? Uh, well, if I were an Iraqi, uh, obviously I would try to make the best out of the American occupation as the Germans did very well, as Japan did very well, and uh, rebuild their country. Uh, but obviously there are many tens of thousands of Iraqis, many hundreds of thousands who are grateful that they were freed from Saddam Hussein regime. There are others from I'm religiously driven or ideological driven who uh, simply feel humiliated with the U.S. liberation of their country. You know, people have a very short memory. You know, I tell you about the example of East Timor. I uh, had to, and in my preface yesterday to pay tribute to Sergio, I recount how many times in my own country I had to keep reminding our people that the international community, the international staff of the UN are there to help us. They are not going to be there 25 years, not even five. Let's make the best use of their presence here. But there were many people with patriotic, revolutionary temperament that wanted the UN out. Well, the UN uh, is living now in May, and many wish the UN would stay much longer. Well, of course, the comparison between the two situations is you know, very uh, far-fetched, but uh, I would say many people in Iraq might one day regret. Many, of course, those who don't want democracy to prevail, who don't want secularism to prevail, they are doing everything to undermine U.S. presence there. It is the U.S. that has to be smarter and working with the Iraqis, with the neighboring Arab countries, and prepare an expeditious transition to Iraqi rule and democracy. It's not going to be easy. But I tell you, when you look at the events today in Iraq, the behavior of the extremists should persuade you only one thing. They must be defeated. They must not be allowed to prevail in Iraq. Their agenda is the overthrow of any secular Arab Muslim regime in the world, whether in Iraq, in Jordan, in Morocco, in Indonesia or Malaysia. This is the agenda of the extremists. This is what they want to do. They see Megawatts of Karnaputri as an enemy. They see King Hussein of Jordan, Abdullah II, as an enemy. They see King Hassan of Morocco as an enemy, because these are moderate, secular Arab regimes. They want to implant Taliban-style rule all over. That is their agenda. Well, they must be defeated. How? That's a whole different question. Thank you. Yes, sir. Your Excellency, uh, thank you very much for your lecture. Would you, like to would you like to comment on the continued house arrest of your fellow Peace Laureate, Aung San Suu Kyi, just across the Thai border, and the continued recorded imprisonment of 1,600 plus democracy activists? This is within the context of 14 plus years of genocide and state-sanctioned rape as a, sta as a tool to suppress the Burmese people, as recorded and debated by the United Nations. Who is Burma's Vietnam, and what is a truly bipolar solution to Burma? I wouldn't uh, say anything new. Uh, and fortunately, there is uh, a strong uh, consensus even among ASEAN countries. As you know, Malaysia, Mahathir himself has spoken out quite strongly about to uh, the urgent need for the release of Do Aung San Suu Kyi and uh, all her uh, uh, colleagues, com compatriots. Sometimes we think only of Do Aung San Suu Kyi when there are many hundreds more uh, 
but of course she's the most visible, the symbol of the democracy struggle there. It was uh, unthinkable a year or two years ago that ASEAN countries would take such a stand on the base of that the then prevailing notion of uh, non-interference in internal affairs. So ASEAN itself has come a long way. And the authorities in Myanmar must have taken notice of uh, their increasing isolation from their own friends. I cannot, uh, I'm not party to the talks, but I have followed. Uh, and I'm, uh, I would say, reasonably optimistic that soon we will see the release of Suchi and we will see a much uh, faster and clearer roadmap towards a resolution of the problem in Burma. But I also want to say something that for some of you might be controversial. In uh, June 2002, I was in uh, Spain, in Madrid. I was uh, invited by the Spanish government as a guest at the ASEM meeting. And we are not members of ASEAN, so we are not uh, party to the ASEM dialogue, but I was invited there and uh, meet with the foreign minister of Spain, who was then chairman of EU, and uh, several others. I dare to voice my opinion on the situation in Burma, Myanmar, and that was very simple. There, is a window, there was a window of opportunity. After a long time, a lot of pressure, lobbying, Suu Kyi was released. There were release of many other of her uh, followers. There was any NLD offices were being open. open. I told the Europeans and the US side, you must respond with proportional measures, gradually lifting some of the sanctions. You must return to Rangu Yangon. The World Bank, UNDP should go in there. When a door in a situation like Myanmar, like it was in East Timor, a door is slightly open, you step in. Well, what did they do? They do what was politically correct. Continue with sanctions. No corresponding gestures on the part of the international community. Just remember this, when Suu Kyi was ambushed, she was alone all alone, not one diplomat, not one NGO, no media. Had people seized on that opportunity, gone back en masse to Myanmar, it would have been far more difficult for them to close back the door. My point is, well, sometimes we miss opportunities that are offered to us to exploit a situation. I hope that if situation arises in the next few weeks or months, we don't lose again uh, this opportunity. Sanctions, yes, are politically correct. But sanctions, as an end in itself, as a political gesture, without also corresponding creative ideas how to move, well, it, I, I don't know about the consequences of sanctions in Myanmar, but I would be disheartened if I know that it's really hurting the small street vendors, the small farmers, in the sanctions in South Africa, during the apartheid era, succeeded and brought down, helped to bring down the regime because it was well targeted on the banking and financial sector. In Myanmar, can you target the bank financial sector? No. When the U.S. announced no more uh, you know, restriction on imports from Myanmar, it meant it means $300 million in export to U.S. is lost. And who is being affected? I don't know, because I'm not so terribly familiar with the economy of Myanmar to know, but I would be afraid, I would be disheartened if, to know that if it, it would be the peasants, the farmers, the small street shops that would close down because of that. What have we achieved with that? Hi, Voting England from Lee Jakarta. Um, one could say that East Timor exists in a kind of tripolar situation. You've got 
Australia, the US, you've got China, you've got Indonesia, so this may affect your ability to answer the question. How do you feel about Wiranto running for president in Jakarta? Okay, well, uh, thank you. You are a good person. Finally, someone asked me a question about East Timor. <laughs> uh, maybe as I, I was, you know, we have not been very much in the news uh, lately, and that maybe is good news. And, uh, and uh, rightly so, you know, with so many other provinces in the world, we cannot always expect, you know, journalists to uh, pay attention to, uh, East, uh, to East Timor. But I want to use this opportunity to say, you know, how eternally grateful, you know, we all are to those of you who over the years, but in particular in 99, covered the situation there. If it were not for the courage of many of you, I don't know whether the Security Council would have been mobilized into action and ending the violence as it did in September 99. So, uh, uh, please, you know, in your spare time, if you are not in other more exciting places, uh, please uh, come and visit us. You don't have to always write nice things about us. And we are even so poorly organized that we cannot keep track on uh, the different <laughs> articles journalists write. Uh, so if you write something very bad today about us, by next week we probably forgot about it or we never read about it. So, no. <laughs> Don't be afraid of that. Uh, in uh, God, in the meantime, I forgot your question. Well, so, oh, we don't, sorry. Well, I tell you, you know, uh, Indonesia is a country of 220 million people. They have uh, some extraordinary individuals. Don't they have uh, someone else to be... Uh, <laughs> to be president of Indonesia. You know, I do not wish to interfere in who the Indonesian people are going to elect, but I tell you, if they re-elect Megawatt Sukarno Putri, we in Istimur would be, would be celebrating with joy. So that's all I, uh, I, can, uh, I can say. Uh, it would be, I think, uh, you know, very embarrassing for Indonesia if by some uh, accident, or, you know, uh, we run to would can be uh, would be elected president. God, I don't want to to imagine uh, myself an Indonesian citizen and having someone like that as the head of state. Yes, sir. Yes, I'm Brennan Jones, and I had the honor of spending a couple of years in, in East Timor. Um, I I wanted to ask you. Um, there's a concern on my part, having worked with the UN, that the impression is that the United Nations is going to go into Iraq and be the saviors and put out the bush fire. Um, I wanted to ask you, with a jaundiced eye, to look at your own experience in terms of the UN in East Timor, both the period running the country and the period since uh, independence, and what you would tell the Iraqis today um, are the assets and the liabilities. God, uh, the UN uh, experiment in Istanbul, you know, in final analysis, you know, the, the balance uh, is a highly positive one. The UN, because of Kofi Annan leadership and Serge leadership on the ground, can rightly, rightfully claim that uh, it is a UN great success story. But as I told many times in Security Council, in the previous two years or so whenever I appeared before Security Council, while appealing to the Security Council, to the international community to, to remain engaged in support of us, I also pledged to the Security Council that we, the Timorese leaders, will do our share to ensure peace and security. If leaders in a given country, in a conflict uh, country, conflict situation, are not capable among themselves, for whatever reasons, or if do not, they do not have a authority, credibility with their own people, then the UN would have a very, very little chance of succeeding. Brandon, you know, you know, in East Timor, how many times, you know, I would be, I would, I was asked 
I got a phone call from Sergio of some of his uh, aides. Please, Jose, can you come and talk to the demonstrators? I would rush in to the entire building where Sergio was working. And the moment I arrived, the demonstrator would applause, would stop, and I would talk to them. And then they would pack and leave. And it happened many times. And I was one of those who did this kind of dialogue with the people in partnership with the UN. We had a perfect partnership, not in the beginning. In the beginning, there was a lot of frustration. Many Timorese were sidelined. Timorese were being hired only as interpreters and drivers. But then, gradually, more and more, responsibility were given to the Timorese. The Timorese leadership, some at least, had credibility authority to the people. But, uh, so, if that is not there, if the Iraqis do not have a Shanan Guzman, or do not have a Mandela, or do not have a, I don't know, you know, some of the prominent credible leaders that we know around the world, well, then it is difficult for the UN to succeed. In Kosovo, they have uh, some good partners in uh, Kosovo, and they are succeeding. In Afghanistan, have uh, an extraordinary man, Hamid Karzai, although under tremendous pressure and difficulties. I'm afraid that the UN uh, will have uh, some very, very serious problems. The US is handing, finally seem to come to its senses and work want to work with the UN. I presume, you know, Kofi Annan knows a bit more on uh, nation building than uh, Donald Rumsfeld, and, uh, or in organizing elections, you know, when, uh, when we think back about the previous elections in the United States, particularly in the state of Florida, <laughs> I would say that it's a good thing to ask the UN to organize the elections in Iraq. But while it's important to hand over part of the responsibility to the UN, it is, it would be hypocritical, cynical, disastrous if the US would use the UN as an excuse to exit quickly. Then it would be a disaster. The US must mend fences with its European allies and with the UN to provide credible security conditions in the country so that the UN can uh, uh, work effectively. Just very briefly, um, is it realistic to expect, given your experience with two national elections in East Timor, is it realistic to expect to hold elections in June in, in Iraq? No, it is not realistic. Uh, in this regard, I f fully agree with the uh, US uh, caution and prudence. You know, look at East Timor, you know, very peaceful, small country, and it took quite a while to properly organize elections. Of course, the Shiites in uh, Iraq, they want the election now because they know they're going to win. You know, and uh, the, lesser, the lesser civil society in Iraq is organized, the lesser the secular uh, people are organized, where well, the more chances for uh, the religious-oriented groups to succeed. So that's why they're putting that much pressure, but doesn't seem to be much room to maneuver for the US side. Maybe, you know, uh, one last point about East Timor, in the case of East Timor and the UN. One aspect that is missing in Iraq is this. In the case of East Timor, there was a real partnership of countries in, uh, in Timor. And that is, you have uh, the ASEAN countries, from Thailand to the Philippines to Singapore, Malaysia, together with South Korea, Australia, New Zealand, with uh, even China and Japan, working closely in living up to their responsibilities. East Timor, after all, is a Southeast Asian conflict, and ASEAN leaders stood up to their responsibility. And do we see this in Iraq? Is the Arab League performing its responsibilities? or it keeps looking out from the window, criticizing the U.S., and being afraid of getting involved. Well, regional countries, neighbors of Iraq, must accept the responsibilities and help the U.N. or the U.S. in uh, uh, stabilizing the situation there. Could I... Uh, uh
<coughs> Lynn Arnold, and could I build on uh, Brennan's question and your answer, Your Excellency? Um, it seemed to me that you have been talking very strongly and cogently about uh, the, the, the occasions when unilateralism becomes a legitimate response to the failure of multilateralism. And uh, you gave very powerful cases in the case of uh, Cambodia, in the case of Uganda, in the case of uh, Kosovo. Uh, just now you've spoken about uh, the, the role for multilateral institutions in the reactive or post-crisis phase. But I want to take you back to the comments of Kofi Annan at the time of Kosovo when he publicly acknowledged, I think probably for the first time uh, uh, for a Secretary General of the UN, that the, the concept of a nation having the right to do what it wants within its territory and not, uh, not to be interfered with was a challengeable concept. And that, uh, that that's something that should be challenged by the nations of the world on behalf of the peoples of the world. Now, that's where the failure of multilateralism has most often come, is the failure to want to get involved in those internal affairs. You've talked about the successes post-crisis of multilateral institutions. What would your suggestions be about how that message of Kofi Annan in 1998 could actually find its way into the acting principles of multilateral institutions? What advice would you give about how that should happen? What, how might it look so that there would not be future occasions when multilateral uh, responses would be, would be failures, resulting in perhaps the need for unilateral activities? Well, I would uh, go back again to Kofi Annan in his speech yesterday in Oslo, where in referring to uh, Bosnia, in referring to Rwanda, he said, the failure of the international community in these two tragic situations had to do with lack of political will. We can reform the UN, as many argue, and I also strongly argue, but uh, as long as there is no political will on the part of those who make up the UN, the UN will continue to be failing and uh, be the scapegoat for uh, the lack of consistency, political courage of the member states. Why did the UN did not intervene in the case of Cambodia in the 70s? Well, we know why. Why Clinton had to go through NATO instead of going to the Security Council, we know why. So, uh, and it's going to be very, very difficult for uh, this particular issue to be addressed unless you have uh, leaders of great stature leading us in the world that know that in the face of certain situations, they must come together through dialogue, patient diplomacy, and for a consensus. But consensus that should not be on the basis of the lowest common denominator just for the sake of it then it becomes again a farce. So, and for that, I don't have uh, answers. Uh, so anyway, <laughs> it's very difficult. Uh, and I just hope that uh, whoever, you know, well, in Washington today or next year, will make an extra effort to mend fences with the UN, with the European Union, and with the rest of the world. And I think that is possible. The Europeans also must work halfway in meeting the US side. You know, uh, as you know, I'm not an American citizen, no particular debt of gratitude to the US for whatever reason, but I found also sometimes that the whole debate leading to the Iraqi crisis, particularly comments and the attitudes of many in Europe, were a bit unfair towards the US. Whatever it seems, remember one thing, the Europeans fail to intervene in their own backyard in Bosnia and Kosovo. The U.S. had to do it. The Middle East is a geographic, historical, cultural, let's say, domain, quote-unquote, of Europe. What has Europe done to address the Middle East question? Instead, no. responsibility is always assigned to the U.S. It is the U.S. not doing this, it is the U.S. is not doing that. We see many demonstrations. My, my friends in Korea, in one of my favorite countries in the world is South Korea. I've been there a million times, love those people, and they love demonstrations, and particularly against the United States. <laughs> but if the U.S. were to pull out of South Korea today, can you imagine the repercussions? Or if the U.S. were to say, we are tired of criticism, we are living in Asia. We leave Japan, 
we leave the, the Korean Peninsula, well, you will see a huge arms race with the, some of the mid-sized regional powers trying to assert themselves. And they would not be able to assert themselves. They don't have enough economic, military might to be the unchallenged regional power. So you'd have a, and that's why I say, well, until someone reinvent a UN that is capable to be the balancing power in some region of the world, well, this function has been exercised by the US. Whether we like it or not, this has been the fact. I guarantee you, today if the US leave Korea, its stock market currency collapse. There'll be panic. And it would, there would be re ripple effect elsewhere throughout East Asia, Southeast Asia. So anyway, I think I've been diverting a bit from uh, your original question. <laughs> Do you think that uh, another possible alternative to the might of the United States would be a um, European Union army? It has been an idea that has been floating around for many, many years, but the Europeans can never get their act together. Uh, would that, uh, a united European army would um, uh, play a balancing act for the might of the United States? I would say, with due respect, no. For the time being, and for the next, I don't know, 20, 30, 50 years, I would say, don't tamper with the Atlantic Alliance. It has survived 50 years. It has shown to be a credible military, political force, cohesive. There is, uh, the Europeans try, you know, the Western Union, you know, uh, and uh, it will exist mostly on paper. And, uh, I, and I think, uh, while there might be some rivalries time to time between the U.S. and Europe, the reality is that they share common strategic interests and uh, values. This particular administration in Washington has certain views of Europe. The Europeans have certain views of this particular administration, but these are passing. And maybe sometime in the future, you know, there will be a better climate between them. And I mention this because these two economic powers, the U.S. and the European Union, to be expanded now in May to 25 members, encompassing, you know, some 500 million people or more, well, are vital for the well-being of the, of the world. Any more questions? I'm Lowell Barton with Thailand Timeout. Your Excellency, thank you for the perspective on American role in uh, <coughs> the world. We expats sometimes get a little paranoid about our role. However, I have a quick question. Um, prior to 1999, would East Timor have welcomed unilateral intervention? And if so, what countries would you have selected? Thank you. <laughs> That's not a very nice question. <laughs> I would say I would, ha would have uh, selected either New Zealand or Iceland. <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions, please? Well, I'll oh, go ahead, please. Go ahead, sir. Thank you very much. My name is Nicholas Howe, and I'm one of those uh, UN workers. <coughs> I'm with the uh, High Commissioner for Human Rights. Jose, so thinking about the doctrine which you're presenting here, it, um, I hear, I'm historically you can justify it by selecting out those genocides or potential genocides where we look back and say, yes, the, the unilateral intervention saved a lot of lives. But the doctrine that you're presenting is one really of the failure of multilateralism and saying that it is the doctrine of the powerful. Because, of course, the state which defines what is a, a humanitarian intervention in your world, which you're laying out, is the power, is the country that, that, that has the power. And so I hope you're not advocating it as what should happen. It seems a very realistic uh, explanation of the world as it is. But maybe I can goad you into maybe saying what you would like to see, because it is the failure of multilateralism which is filled, with, where, where the vacuum is filled by this... Uh, expression of power which defines and, and so you know are you saying that you would therefore support a US um, definition of uh, future conflicts which, you, which it would uh, create 
for the uh, uh, justified reason of humanitarian uh, intervention. Well, uh, thank you for these uh, questions that give me the opportunity to clarify. Uh, no, definitely I would not assign to a particular country, whatever it, it is, the moral or legal uh, authority to define, to decide when uh, it should intervene. You know, as I said in my comment was essentially that the U.S. unilateral intervention in uh, Iraq has also to be, to be seen in the context of the failure of the U.N. as a whole, that having adopted truckloads of resolutions on Iraq, failed to implement them. And uh, I would hope that uh, the, in Washington they would be doing some soul searching, some uh, real evaluation analysis of how costly, not only economically but politically, how costly it has been this intervention in Iraq and that would make extra effort in the future to lead, to uh, mobilize consensus. Leadership, after all, is our ability to engage the other side in dialogue and persuade them to join us. That's why I say, can the U.S. lead? One can lead with persuasion. One can lead with our uh, standards. That, you know, people automatically, yes, they are inspired. They say, yes, we go to this. We follow this particular country. There's an interesting article today or yesterday in the International Herald Tribune on the emerging role of Brazil under current President Lula. You know, at least in Latin America, everyone is shifting their attention to Lula's leadership. Well, not because, you know, Brazil has an all-powerful uh, army that people are afraid of uh, is such a dominant economic power, but I think he's speaking with some uh, clarity, with some moral persuasion, gain authority, credibility, and people automatically look for all this. So the U.S., someone of the vision of the standing of a John Kennedy, you know, uh, could automatically, you know, galvanize people to, uh, to support its agenda. The question now, you know, so I hope that the, in Washington and elsewhere in Europe, because responsibilities also belong to the Europeans and elsewhere, to really uh, reflect on uh, the various failures of the UN, not only Iraq, but Rwanda, as Kofi Annan himself said yesterday. And what could we do? You know, there is now a commission of wise people to make some recommendations towards the General Assembly end of this year in September for reforms of the UN. Well, you know, we know that one of the obsolete aspects of the UN is precisely the veto power. Is also the fact that, you know, God, you know, 60 years almost after the founding of the UN, we still have the same group of people, countries, holding this privileged status with veto power in Security Council. You have a, a little UK, you know, no offense to UK, it's, it was a former great empire, uh, a little France, again, no offense to France, you know, I have great affection and admiration for France. But uh, I say little when you compare France and UK with India, for instance. 1.3 billion people, 1.1 billion people, in emerging industrial power, and uh, India is not there as a permanent member of Security Council. And, or Brazil. The Western countries are overly represented in Security Council. You have a United States, France, and UK. Asia, only China. And the China was there, luckily, because at the time, under Kuomintang, the US was supporting Taiwan. <laughs> you know, they did not support China because you know ta uh, Taiwan, uh, Chinese state is a permanent member because of uh, uh, the support because you know of uh, Chiang Kai-shek at the time. Otherwise, not even China would have been in this. Permanent Member Security Council. But anyway, we have China. Africa, none. No one. Latin America, no. Well, is it time? It's time to change it. But also eliminate the veto power. To elect a judge to the Interest Court of Justice, you need two-third majority. To make a decision on war and peace, <laughs> one single country can block it, or you can just get away with it with nine votes. A simple majority. Well, where is the logic of it? 
it doesn't mean necessarily that you know expanding the Security Council membership with uh, countries like India and the others, eliminate the veto power, introduce two-third majority system would necessarily make the UN more effective. Again, it go back to leadership, political will. So anyway, I should no. I do not. I would not uh, assign to any country the right to intervene, to decide when to intervene, because obviously it would be only the major powers with m bigger army and economy that find uh, have the, the chance or the opportunity, the means to intervene. Any more questions? We're going to take three more questions. Yeah, go ahead. Your Excellency, thank you for your enlightening and entertaining uh, information tonight. It seems, and I want to ask, if, if is there an underlying, uh, a hidden agenda behind when we've, when we've gone in and when we haven't gone in, the international corporate uh, business interests, sometimes like in Africa, um, perhaps it wasn't to the business interest to go in because eliminating the tribal people and, uh, you know, re releasing those resources to exploitation, then the oil, you know, and all the other things there. Is there not, is that agenda really what's maybe motivating everything rather than, you know, this other humanitarian kinds of things? Uh, you're talking about the Iraqi and... Uh, You know, uh, I can only say uh, if uh, I, I would wish that uh, the U.S. side, uh, particularly the uh, corporations, uh, would show a bit more uh, class and finesse in the way they are jumping into business in Iraq. God, you know, it's really scandalous. You know, nothing wrong in trying to make some quick money but uh, be a bit discreet. <laughs> it's really, you know, it really cheapen, cheapen, you know, the behavior of some of the U.S. corporations and the way they overcharge their own government is really cheapen the whole U.S. Uh, alleged, you know, moral, noble uh, claims to intervene in Iraq. It's really disgusting when I read this. And... Uh, you know, Eli Wiesel, you probably know, you know, Nobel laureate from New York, great man, survivor of Auschwitz. He's written some 60, 70 books. In a statement he issued soon after the Iraq intervention, he said he supported because he ha believes in the integrity of Colin Powell. When Colin Powell argued about the existence of weapons of mass destruction. Well, even the integrity, the credibility of Secretary of State Colin Powell is at the stake. A man who was widely respected. If someone like Colin Powell, you know, has seen, seen his credibility, totally, because he was on Security Council arguing, and then they have not found weapons of mass destruction. For me, I never participated, never in got involved in this whole exercise of weapons of mass destruction. For me, the issue boiled down always to how this world community in this day and age, after the Holocaust, after Khmer Rouge, Idi Amin, after knew, knowing what we knew about Saddam Hussein, we still sit there and treat the man as head of state with all the privileges and immunities and impunity. No, the man had to be brought down. How? Was the U.S. the right uh, authority to do it? Well, that is a whole different question. But the man had to go. It's just morally indefensible that Saddam Hussein, like Pol Pot in Cambodia, should stay, have stayed in power. I applauded the Vietnamese when they intervened in Cambodia and br brought down the Khmer Rouge regime. Good for them. Must be applauded. And as I applauded Julius Nerere when he ordered the intervention 
in Uganda and brought down that grotesque uh, personality, Idi Amin. But was the U.S., did the U.S. have enough credibility for people to understand, yes, you go to Iraq? Well, it seemed like not. So it went without anyone believing that the U.S. had any real noble goals. And then after that, with uh, these, some of these big uh, corporations, some linked to the current vice president, doing what they did in Iraq, God, I believe people like Elie Wiesel must be so embarrassed. Yes, sir. No, 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 no. Sure. Uh, your Excellency, um, we are all, I guess, very impressed by your international experience of dealing with crisis. So I would like to ask you a few questions about um, controversies with uh, Iraq. For example, um, it seems in your speech that you say it's better to have a decisive U.S. leadership than an inefficient uh, U.N. Uh, non-leadership or lack of leadership. Um, there was a controversy about the atrocities and almost a genocide committed by Saddam Hussein in Iraq in the 80s, in the 1980s and not the 1990s at the time. Iraq was at war with Iran. But the West, almost as a rule, preferred to deal with Iraq against Iran than the other way around. In other words, it was kind of real politics. Better to work with the lesser evil. How do you feel with this situation? And do you still think that the US had a case to invade Iraq in 2003? And just uh, one last thing. Well, you, you, you replied already about the WMDs. Um, that's, all, that's all, that's all, that's enough. Thank you. Well, uh, in my comments, as well in the preface that I wrote yesterday for the book on Serge de Mello, I said precisely this, that uh, in the tragic story of Iraq, there are no heroes, only villains, precisely because the world community the U.S., the Europeans, uh, turn a blind eye for the most of the time of that despotic regime. They woke up to him only after the Gulf War, after his audacious invasion of uh, Kuwait. Then when they began to uh, try to uh, expose the nature of the regime. I remember in uh, Geneva, over the years that I went there to the Commission of Human Rights, up to uh, 1990, 1990, the previous year, if I'm not mistaken, in 89, the State Department official line at the time was that there were, the words, I, I could be wrong, but I think they were saying something along these lines, there had been remarkable progress on the human rights front in Iraq. Then came the invasion in 90. In 91, the U.S. was leading the effort to have a resolution in the Commission of Human Rights condemning Iran. So, and uh, that's why I say, no, no real heroes there. But the fact is, Saddam Hussein didn't change. People were being executed, were found still in torture chambers as the coalition forces entered Baghdad and elsewhere in Iraq. So it was not only in the 80s. The killings continue till the very last minute. And uh, I only can say, you know, I was overjoyed when I saw Saddam Hussein being captured. Well, finally, one despot less. Your Excellency, let's leave it right for a second and close uh, with a question about Thailand, without interfering in the internal affairs of, uh, of Thailand. I'd like your opinion about Thaksin Shinwat. Uh, the richest man in the country is the Prime Minister, the undisputed Prime Minister. Uh, how do you feel about his record in human rights, press freedom, uh, and issues like that? Uh, Without interfering in the internal affairs of Thailand, of course. 
And uh, you were uh, alleging earlier that you were a friend of mine. <laughs> <laughs> really, really a great friend. <laughs> well, uh, I have to say, you know, uh, I'm the foreign minister of uh, Timor-Leste, and uh, it would not be proper for me uh, in visiting Thailand and commenting on uh, this uh, government, the host country uh, policies. Uh, I read the Thai media, you know, the English Thai media, and I uh, find uh, extraordinary the barrage of criticism, editorial opinions, and everything else, you know, in criticism of the government. Contrast this with 20 years ago or with 10 years ago. Well, democracies in Thailand, Philippines, India, and many other countries in East Timor might not be perfect, but uh, I think there have been some uh, dramatic uh, changes when we compare with uh, the past. I, uh, all I can say is that uh, uh, in my own country, in East Timor, we have a free dynamic media that uh, entertain itself almost every day criticizing our Prime Minister. They don't uh, criticize the President, well, because he is the President and he doesn't deal day to day with uh, executive matters, so he does no wrong. If you were to, uh, you know, be the executive authority and having to create jobs and economy, I think, uh, I don't know whether his popularity it would be as high as it is today. We uh, have been criticized by some uh, foreign media, particularly from Australia, and yet we are still friends. And uh, in East Timor, I believe the worst thing that could happen to our national democracy if we were to start uh, being hostile to the media because they happen to criticize our government. I prefer to talk about what we can do, we try to do in East Timor, uh, to not to fail to betray you know, our people and not to fail and betray your own uh, trust. Many of the journalists, I know you journalists always like to be neutral, uh, take no sides, but many of you, uh, personally, emotionally, were very sympathetic to Timur and did everything to help the cause by reporting about it. And many of you probably would feel betrayed, cheated, if one day you were to find out is Timur on the number 10 or number one list of uh, Transparency International for corruption. And uh, so I would say that, you know, scrutiny by the media, international, domestic, for us is vital for uh, our democracy to uh, consolidate and, uh, and, and to really gain uh, roots uh, so that no one ever in Timor would uh, be tempted to uh, uh, ban freedom of expression and free press. Jose Ramos Horda, it's been an honor and a privilege having you at the club. Ladies and gentlemen, Thank you very much, and good night. Thank you. Thank you.